How do we express our identities? Is it by the clothes we wear? Or what we decorate our homes with? Or the accessories we carry around in public? What do these all have in common? They're all made from textiles. The textile industry has woven itself into our everyday lives, most notably in our apparel and home furnishings. It stands as one of the oldest and most lucrative industries, predicted to be worth $2,100 billion by 2025. But as successful as the textile industry may be, it is also one of the most environmentally taxing. Before you can buy your t-shirt at the store, textiles must go through a long supply chain, from the farm to factory to factory. First, raw materials must be acquired, then weaved, dyed, and finished with chemicals until they're exported for further processing. Although scientists and consumers have begun to point their fingers at the fast fashion industry for excessive textile waste, the entire textile industry is responsible for global scale pollution due to its excessive water consumption. For example, the agriculture of raw materials like cotton consumes an unsustainable amount of water and pesticides. But an even more alarming form of pollution comes from textile dyeing. The dyeing and finishing process directly account for 35% of all industrial chemicals released into the environment. Think about it this way. It's 200 to 700 liters of water to dye one kilogram of textiles. Now let's look at 2025, where the textile industry is predicted to produce 100 million tons in textile fibers. See the problem? If you were to take a cup of this dyed wastewater, also known as effluent, it would likely consist of concentrated dye, salt, chemical auxiliary agents, and heavy metals. None of this is good for the environment. Diaflune is toxic, carcinogenic, and has a low biodegradability, meaning it's almost impossible for it to break down on its own. If released into the environment, this salty, sometimes acidic, colored waste increases water turbidity, meaning less light can pass through it. This decreases the ability of underwater plants and microorganisms to undergo photosynthesis to create oxygen thus increasing chemical oxygen demand, COD, and biological oxygen demand, BOD. With less oxygen, less organisms can be sustained in the polluted ecosystem. The reason why dyed water is so harmful to the environment is due to color-emitting portions of the molecule called chromophores. Chromo, Greek for color, and four, Greek for carrying. The Phoenicians were the first to yield the use of these chromophores as early as 1570 BC in creating royal Tyrian purple out of predatory snail shells. 3,000 years later in the 19th century would William Henry Perkin synthetically create a dye called mauvine or Perkin's mauve. This would lead to the departure from natural dyes to synthetic ones due to their greater color diversity, color intensity, faster dyeing time, and cheaper price even if it's at the cost of the environment. So why is this mess so hard to clean up? Dyes are large compounds that get their color due to the derivatives of this guy, benzene and other aromatic rings. Benzene is a six carbon ring with alternating double bonds. In this ring, if energy, say a ray of sunlight hits it, this ray of light causes the electrons that were once in their ground state suddenly forced into an excited state. Now let's look at this synthetic dye with a lot more double bonds and rings. While this molecule looks big and scary, it's responsible for this beautiful color. The more double bonds next to each other, the more places your electron, like a ball in a pinball machine, can bounce off. The longer you can sustain your game of pinball, the more likely that your compound will emit a color that we can see in the visible spectrum. Synthetic dyes often dwarf natural dyes in size. The more rings and double bonds, the more stable the dye is. These rings give the compounds a strong, stable backbone, so the compound is happier when bonds get to stay together rather than broken apart. This makes synthetic dyes imperious to sunlight, bacteria, and physical weathering as opposed to smaller and less stable natural dyes. This durability, while great when trying to dye a fabric cheaply, makes dye compounds harder to degrade and clean up. So how does one 
clean up diet effluent. Effluent is treated through three major phases. The primary, which consists of skimming the water of solid waste. Aerobic bacteria are sent to break down fibers to create CO2. The second phase involves the degradation of large dye compounds. This is done by oxidation, where reactants such as hydrogen peroxide, ozone, or UV light attack the benzene ring in the large dye to break them apart until the compound is less stable. The last phase is treating the water for its salinity, where electricity is used to separate the salt ions from the water. Today, more research is being applied to use microorganisms in marshlands to biologically break down these compounds. Not only is the use of swamps and marshlands environmentally sustainable, but they are relatively inexpensive means to clean effluent in developing countries. Although it's up to the industry to change their pollution habits, we as consumers can reduce our own demand for textiles. Thrifting and donating old clothes are two good ways anyone can take to reduce their carbon footprint and associated dye waste. We all have some agency in these choices, even if the choice is to educate yourself on a type of pollution you've never thought of before.